Best Podcast Ever is sponsored by the Gertzberg Law Firm, a full-service business law firm in Cleveland and Chagrin Falls that's changing the way businesses retain their attorneys. Go to GertzbergLaw.com to learn more. While you're there, check out Cover My Six, a complete legal audit of the six areas that most often create or prevent business lawsuits and government investigations. Go to CoverMySix.com to learn how we keep you safe. Enjoy the show. Stay tuned after the episode for a legal tip from Nick Weiss of the Gertzberg Law Firm about medical marijuana. Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to listen to the best podcast ever recorded. I've forgotten things most men dream about. Molly Gepler. Hey, Alex Gertzberg. What are you doing, dude? No, you're doing better. We talked a little earlier, and you had rated your day as a six. Yeah, I'm really glad that you, that, that you just mentioned that, because I thought that would be worthwhile to talk about during our banter session yeah. just now. So I had a six of a day. It started out as like a nine. nine no, out of you ten. said it started out as a ten. ten. Yeah, it so... started out as a ten out of ten mood-wise. And then um, I had some good meetings, and it stayed up there. And then I um, read some some reports, some financial reports, and they were not where I wanted them to be. And I, my mood just kind of took a hit. Got you. Know? you. And like, I don't know. It's, it's, I'll spare you the details, but um, certain key performance indicators are not where I want them to be. Are not performing. Certain ones aren't. And uh-huh. so my mood just kind of went down and I told you that and you said, what did you, it was so great what you said. You said, Alex, do you not remember Monday's podcast? Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, thanks, Bob. Yeah, which was with Jim Maloney. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Guy almost should be dead. Yeah. Got blown up three times in Iraq. Yeah. So if you haven't listened to that episode, the episode right before this one, um, I believe episode 52 yeah. um, with Jim Maloney. And if you want to, if you think you're having a bad day. Which was one of the big takeaways yeah. was how do you, how do you know that that happens to people? Certainly to someone we now know, but also to other people mm-hmm. and then come back and just bitch about key performance indicators and how they ruin your day so instantly and this is the this is what what's important and why i wanted to talk about because the next thing you said was or the reminder look at your wrist right and so what we also talked about on monday is how i have this mindful bracelet now that reminds me to stay present and not worry about the future Mm -hmm. or 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 regret the past or Mm -hmm. be anywhere but the here and now when I should be in the here and now. And you and what was great about that conversation was how it was like a light switch, you know? And it reminded me of the power that people have to just focus their attention and just be decisive about it. Just decide I'm not gonna piss and moan about right. stuff. I'm you know? bringing myself back, reeling myself back in. Yeah, like- and then you said to me, do you remember what you said to me after I said all that? See, this is the problem right here, Molly. I think we I think we just diagnosed the issue. You I wasn't present. present. You said yeah. I'm the best chick ever. Mm. Well, I say that all the time. <laughs> so I just I, I guess I forgot. Oh. You were the best. You are the best chick ever. Oh, I... Except for the lady sitting to your left. Uh-huh. Your daughter, your lovely daughter. You have Emily. an audience today. Mm. I asked Emily uh when you were in the kitchen, I go, Do you want to be on mic? Because we've got an extra microphone. <laughs> And she said, what what'd you say? Said, like, I just said, my mom likes to be in the spotlight, like, yeah. but I do not. Yeah. She's like, but no, but what was funny is before I even got the sentence out, she was like, uh, no. Well, no. I think we're going to have Emily as a podcast guest. I think she has a lot to share about her New York experience Only and the interning with a, yeah. a top designer. And so, yeah. yeah, I think we'll get her on as a, as a podcast guest. Yes, and mm-hmm. what does I mean? The big question everyone wants to know is what does Christian Suriani Suriano eat for lunch? You know, I was just thinking. Right, I gotta know. I know. I gotta know. Everybody's yeah. gotta know. Yeah, everyone's got. So I'm so excited about our guest. Do we have any other banter? We had a great concert last night. So much fun. So they you said so that good. that was your playlist, your workout yeah. playlist. Yeah, I thought they had gone a little too. 
to one side at the end there. I really was a little... Oh, man. Because I was, was pretty specific with them. So, um, here, for, so first of all, it was called Shady Drive. Drive. And I believe they're going to be the Rocks, or they play at the Rocks. You know, they're yeah. mostly a West Side band. I uh, loved Shady Drive yesterday. So this was at Bainbridge Park, part of the uh, Chagrin Valley Chamber of Commerce, Gertzberg Law Firm. Simple Summer, summer simple Nights. Summer Nights concert yes. series. Yes. And um, yeah, you were like, I have no idea how these dudes are going to be. And I, I, when we were up there introducing the band... Um, I saw their iPad up on the stage with their playlist, and I was like, "Holy shit, these are the best tunes!" Uh-huh. It was like we were Zeppelin, Hendrix. Uh, it was Stevie Vaughan, St- Stevie Ray Vaughan, Allman Brothers. It was all of my favorite yeah. classic rock tunes. The Whipping Post. That's your. Jam. That's how they ended. That's my they, ended jam. The sh- they had a three-song Allman Brothers medley at the end, mm-hmm. which was sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they do they did what I I love when live. When they when 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 bands do this live, is they went in and out of of different songs. Fish is really big with that. They had a just a pure instrumental medley in the middle yes. of one song, and they kept coming back in and out of that one tune. I love. They were it. good. They were it. really good. Check out Shady Drive, folks. That's you good are stuff. not coming to our summer nights. I mean, it was just a great that one family with all the kids, and they yeah. were running around. Yeah. And your kids were there playing soccer and. I mean, it yeah. just is a, and it's all free. You pick up your, you know, your sub from, uh, or your pizza roll from Bell Station. Right. And uh, you're good to go. Yeah. yeah. You're good hey, to do you guys go. want any wine? I brought four glasses. No, we thought you were going to fill them all up for you yourself. Want, no, I'm you good. Yeah, yes, you can fill it up for yourself. No, I'm Emily. Emily might. She is of age now. Yeah, uh, happy, happy birthday, birthday Emily. Emily. 21. A big 21. Wait, um, and I really want to ask Emily a bunch of questions about. Can her you 20... sit in for just yeah. five minutes? Just sit. Get over here, Emily. Come on. Oh, please Come on. help us welcome Emily Gabler to the Emily stage. Emily Gabler, ladies and gentlemen. Oh my goodness, the big two one. How's it feel? Oh, it's great. Is it? Yeah. Any highlights? Uh, how... So this was like a, a week ago now. About a couple weeks. A couple weeks. Yeah. Um, any any highlights from the the festivities or or the. Two weeks after that? Well, low light would be losing a lot of money at the casino. Is that right? Well, yeah. Playing what? Slots. Really? Yeah. What's a lot of money? I mean, like me personally, it was about 70, but I mean, then Molly funded some too. Okay. Yeah. You funded additional losses? Yeah. Okay. Good job, yeah. Mom. Nice. And we're a Texas Hold'em family, so to play slots is very boring for us. We'd rather be I up liked in the poker it. Room. It was fun. It's just yeah. like, it was really fast. It goes fast. Yeah. It goes fast. Molly, uh, did you gamble at the casino? I did. I play? did. Um, slots. They're just so stupid. I mean, I don't understand them. Yeah. I don't, like, I'll see five apples across, yeah. like, in a line, and I don't win. Yeah. And then the next one, there's an apple here and an orange here and a grape here, and then I, I win. Like, I, I just, I can't understand yeah. it yeah I, I have several problems with slot machines one is um you relinquish complete control you of no your control. money Absolutely. to somebody else and two is when you look to your left and to your right you realize you're in a zombie movie <laughs> and everyone is smoking and half dead yeah. and uh <laughs> Social security checks oh flying all goodness. around yeah we did find one we liked um one old person no no <laughs> what, slot machine? <laughs> Wait, what slot machine um the one where like the big wheel and i'm the i'm the no, obnoxious you liked that yeah and then we went and, and we sucked at one. it yeah we didn't i'm like that it obnoxious person that just you know i like to get the whole crowd going yeah. and like if it's a big oh. wheel i'm like all right let's come on big money and i, I like, like to that. I yeah. like to get everybody Keep it excited. Festive. Absolutely. You know, when I, uh, I when I go, I just play blackjack and poker, and I always make a lot of banter with the um, dealer. The dealer. Because subconsciously, I feel like it, it's gonna karmic. Slip you it's going to slip It's going to come back to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I just, and we talked about this, I'm just so afraid because I don't know the rules of blackjack, and I know that it's one of those games where people could be mad at you if you yes. if you hit and you, you weren't supposed to. You affect the other players yes. in the game. That's true. I was scared you... to play any card games there. They're intimidating. Yeah. Mm. I wanted to play roulette. But we had fun. What else did we do for your birthday? 
We went to Punch Bowl Social. How was that? Uh-huh. It was fun. I like that it's place. Cool. We played karaoke. We played. We sang karaoke. Oh, you posted video of it. You we had sang our own room. Uh, a, lot. So, a lot of songs. Okay. An hour worth of songs. We sang a lot. <laughs> we sang a lot. <laughs> Love Shack. Love. Love Shack. I sang Africa. Yes. Really? Yeah. yeah. And 500 Miles and Come on Eileen. Yes, that's <laughs> That's huge. my jam. Nice. Uh-huh. I'm Good. convinced that song makes you in a happier mood. But don't listen to the lyrics because it's kind of dirty. Which yeah. song? Africa? No, Come on Eileen. Come on Eileen. Yeah, it's very uh, yeah it, but you're right. It does associate with a, a good mood. It's a good mood. Yeah. yeah, it's like a party tune. Yeah, yeah. It is w- when I hear that song. For some reason, I think of like, like late '80s James Spader and uh, uh, Rob Lowe and like Saint Elmo's Fire kind of. Yes. You know. We were stuff. saying that we should have thought ahead with the spasmatic concept and. Yeah. Um, and we should have had an all day eighties movie at the Township Hall in in celebration or, you know, anticipation of the, the I like spasmatic concept. We should have and an eighties co- or costume candles. Ooh. Um we're gonna idea. wear some eight or an eighties shirt. Yeah, but an eighties shirt is not an eighties outfit. What would be an eighties co- outfit for someone who was born in uh, um nineteen workout eighties? I just did study fashion history. It is true. <laughs> um, it would be like Zeke Havarici's. Oh, and yes, it would, it, be, would be it would be. Button fly, and the, the shirt would come off the shoulder. Monochromatic outfits. Interesting. Oh, oh monochromatic. So just Neon and mesh. And it would also be like, um, it would be like Madonna gloves. Yes. For, for the ladies. Big bow and Madonna mm-hmm. gloves. Yeah. Material and, um, outfit. Um uh Didn't Jane people Fonda. like yeah like leg warmers, warmers. <laughs> <laughs> legs legs and he had legs in 80s polos two polos oh yeah with the pop pop collars collar. but two, I think two of them we, so two i think we should <laughs> tease my hair for the concert oh my gosh my yes. hair is good teasing hair yeah oh, i do bet it. i bet you know um there was a lawyer that i know who wears pop collars now and i can't oh my gosh i, I can't, can't even look at him well i can't bring myself i can't tell if he's joking or not <laughs> and i i don't want to bring to his attention that he looks ridiculous yeah, you know? we want to find him. Is he in this office? No, he's okay. not. But he's with a very well-established firm downtown. Oh boy! Such that I think that um, a lot of folks in that particular firm. This is not the firm I used to work for, but it's another one. Um, I think that um, a lot of them are socially awkward okay. from a, in a fashion sense that way so probably nobody brings it to his right, attention right everyone thinks know. he looks really cool oh my goodness. who's that cool guy with the pop, pop collar maybe that's my uh, that's where i need to go into styling law firms yeah. yes yeah yeah well i actually think that there is a market you know emily seriously think about this right partner up with a traveling um like hair salon lady right and a traveling massage therapist. And then, and what you do, listen, this, I'm telling you, somebody should start this business. The three of you, right, could just create like a rotating schedule where it's a package deal, right? It's basically a traveling spa, but one piece of it is fashion and um, advice for people who don't know how to dress themselves. So it's like the female queer eye, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what they do in Queer Eye? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's like it. a fashion guy and right. a lifestyle guy and hair yeah. guy. Okay. Maybe it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I hear lots of noises out there. Your know. kids are escaping. I really Netflix can't. isn't working. I really should just turn on my phone because Ooh, in case be he's, yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about him before he gets here. So yeah, so this a great is uh, guest. Double D. Double D in yeah. the hay. Are we allowed to say what, it, what the D's stand for? Um, Is he going to get mad at us? Um, disclosing anything? I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe we could just save that. We can ask him when he comes here. Uh, that's fair. Let's yeah. Let's make him say it. Yeah. We'll just ask him the question. So I've known Double D for yeah. a while. Um, yeah. He and I used to work together at Burntwood. Oh. And he's one of those guys that... Everybody seems to know him. Okay. Like everybody 
he um he's kind of a famous bartender i would say yeah. so he's worked a lot of places he's opened a lot of bars huh. and everyone knows him kind of in that field it's interesting and then everyone knows him from the spasmatics which is the band he's the lead singer of um so he just is anytime you say oh we had double d and oh, i Worked with Double D years ago, or I've seen him. So everybody seems to, he's just one hmm. of those people. He's the Kevin Bacon of, of the Sugar right? Valley. Six degrees of Double D. Yes. Interesting. Um, Emily, you know Double D also? I do. How do you, how, through your mom, obviously. Yeah, just through him bartending at Burtwood. Okay. All right. Um, so, and yeah, he's got some crazy facts about him, including, but not limited to, uh, he has met a fan who said that the song he was singing at that time stopped her from committing suicide after her fiance died. Ain't that something? Wow. Right. And, uh, I think that might've even been an original song that he wrote. Well, he was then in a band called Zaza, which is a, right. was an eighties band. Okay. Um, I am privy to have, um, one of his posters, uh, from that time interesting and in, uh, he thinks it's hanging above my bed so we're just gonna <laughs> let him continue on thinking can we tell that. him that it's on your ceiling yes okay yes um and so he uh so that band was voted best cover band by scene magazines best of cleveland 2017 he's performed in the white house with the spasmatics including singing wake me up before you go go for one of the president's bush um he sang the national anthem at yankee stadium oh, he's... all right are we done talking about him behind his back yeah. do you think all right bring him on in what's up double d bring him on in <laughs> <laughs> How goes it, man? You know what? I'm living the dream, spinning the wheel. <laughs> At my age, when you wake up and you're breathing, that's a head start. Oh, stop it. That's what Then like... I've got this guy, Arthur. I'm not even gay, but he's waking up with me every morning. <laughs> and I, I don't appreciate it whatsoever. <laughs> what? Um, what does that mean? You don't know it, Arthur? Is it a real dude? Or is this an imaginary dude? Or... It's... Arthur, Wait, for, say, get closer to the mic though a little bit. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Arthur, uh, am I on? Yeah, you're good. Okay, we're, good. We're rolling. Uh, I don't have any headphones, but anyway, no, um, it's not, not important. Yeah, Arthur is with me, and I'm not gay. Nothing against the gay population because they're going to give me bad emails. But when I wake up in the morning, Arthur's right there with me, and I'm mad at him because you know Arthur, Ar Ar arthritis. Mm, oh, now you got it. Arthur yeah, Ritus yeah. Is I was going to say some morning. other stuff, but I figured that this is a PG hilarious. show. Maybe this not. is a maybe this is a church show. I'm not it even is sure. Not. No. It's it the is the opposite of a church. A yeah. You let it show. all out. Here. We we played honestly uh, in the last month and a half uh, two stadiums, uh, one of which was Ford Field, and uh, we got there and. Uh, we walked into Ford Field, 70,000 people. The dome was closed, and they had this little stage and a band there, and then they had this main stage. It looked like Bon Jovi's equipment, which it was. And then I said to the uh, advanced uh, person that takes care of us, I said, uh, what's we're probably on that stage? Right over there. No, you're on the main stage. And I was like, oh. The Bon Jovi stage? This is, this is really good. So it still doesn't shock. I mean, you've been doing this a long time. It still doesn't shock you. You still don't no, know how big you guys are. I, listen, at one point I was a rock star. I wrote a hit song. I bought a tour bus with the money. I I, I drove the bus after the driver uh, the first week drove into a um, – in the median, he wrecked it into a snowbank because he fell asleep. And I said, that's it. I can't be on this bus unless I'm driving it. So I drove it. But yeah. I, and that I mean, was with Zaza? That was with Zaza. That was 80, late 7, 88, all the way to 92. We, you know, op we opened up for Warrant, Winger, Bad Company, Bad English, Ted Nugent, Damn Yankees, all those and bands. And what was the and song? Tours. The song was called Maybe Tomorrow that I wrote under my name, David Dennis. Did he? Well, it's so I know. It's it's a uh, 
it's a power ballad, you know, with the big hair. Oh. And, you know. It's, You're missing the big hair. I'm missing the big hair. Yeah, I cut that in 96. <laughs> but the point, we were of, looking the, at the point of the story is, yeah, we were on major stages. We played for 100. <laughs> yeah, there it is. We played for 100,000 people in one concert. Yeah. But we also played for four people in a snowstorm and gave them the same show. That's awesome. For yeah. half the price for the owner. This was in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, it, it was unbelievable. It, uh, getting back to that Ford <laughs> Field. Um, yes. You know, just getting on stage and they throw you a, a wireless mic and, and, and in-ears. It's what it's called. It's your in-ear monitors. Uh, it's the newest modern technology that all the bands from U2 to whomever. And then I get to the mic and they go, okay, sound check, uh, you know, speak. Let's Let's get your ears right. And I go check, and it was just like, man, it brought back the old memories of uh, being in a big stage where you couldn't even see the guitar player. He's so far away. So with the modern technology, you just get everyone sounding really good, and you just kind of don't have to even see them. You just know what's going on. So what's going on? going on? I always wonder, what is going on in those ears? That's called your monitor mix. In other words, in the old days, they had those monitors in front of you, and the uh, really big bands like from the Journeys, uh, for instance, they had them in gates on the stage, so you didn't see anything. It looked flat, but yet they were projecting through these gates. And they were speakers. They were speakers, projecting yes, sound. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Projecting your voice so you can hear yourself sing. Oh. Uh, if you okay. don't hear yourself sing, you're gonna just burn out. In a matter right. of a few songs. So you hear your voice as loud as you want it, and then you can hear everybody else. If you can't hear them on stage, if you can't hear the drums, you get a mix of drums. Kick, snare, hat, for instance. If you can't hear the guitar, you get a little guitar in your mix. All their vocals in your mix, you can hear if they're on or not. Okay. So, so the in ear mix the is, it replaces the monitors, and the, and the purpose of which is to allow you to hear what the audience hears. Is that the deal? Well, the audience hears a nice mix of what the sound man produces okay. as, as a band. All right. You, uh, specifically as a musician on stage, you want to hear certain things. I need to hear my voice. I need to hear guitars, bass, and drums, and their vocals. Yeah, I get a whole mix. Okay. So what would I a drummer I get basically want? what you're really hearing out there. I get that. What would a own. drummer want to hear? Drummer, my drummer just gets a vocals and maybe a little guitar and bass. That's it. And okay. my lead vocal up for everybody so they know where I'm at, know where they're at. So, okay. But yeah, we feed off the drummer. Can we get some vitals here? Can we get some biographical Yeah, we data? need to go way so, back. Oh, we, we just jumped right in. Well, the first question is, <laughs> Molly, no, we, were having fun. We, we weren't sure if we had permission to um, use the full D in double D. Like, are we he allowed to say? He did say it already, though. Oh, he did? Noticed. Yes. Did I miss it? He was said that he wrote his song under... David Dennis. David. Double D is my nickname. David Dennis. My full name is David Dennis Mackey. Okay. Oh, we have it wrong. Um... Uh, David Dennis was my stage name in 87 when uh, I joined Zaza uh, after learning my craft in a band called Quick, which was a touring cover band. Uh, my first my first tour was 83. I toured uh, Florida. Cover that, band for whom? It, j- just, a cover, just, just a cover band. Just a cover band playing okay. gotcha. uh, popular music gotcha. of the 80s because okay. we were in the 80s. So whatever was popular. It'd be How like, were you at the time? Oh, I was shoo, back then. I was I was twenty one years old. Okay, when I started, it's a yeah. pretty good deal for a twenty one year old. Yeah, I came home from from college. I won the uh, fight night, the uh, welterweight championship. What? I called Get my <laughs> yeah. I can't tell if you're full of shit. Right? Uh, uh, oh, he's the is that true? He's never. Full <laughs> when I'm telling you something, I'm telling you something, and I got pictures to back it I'm up because don't I have did a photo iPad. of all my life. Yes, where's the iPad? That's my favorite at nights home. at Burntwood. He would bring the iPad out, and there'd be Welterweight. he and George Bush, and yeah, um, yes. Uh, we don't tend to talk about it much, but that's 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 me in the white. I mean, you're looking at some pictures of me. And we will get these pictures uh, for our, yeah, our yeah, listeners. Yeah, let's make so sure that these get up on the well, website here. It, here, the most important picture is this. <laughs> this is where you are. A winner. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, look at that. So, oh, there it is. And then you have blood on your shirt. 
that's my nose that the blood is from. That, <laughs> Believe like, me. Well, how come, why are you boxing in like a, like a like a white, a white beater, beater tank shirt. top and like Be, Freddie Mercury shorts in that? Picture? Because in back in that day, yeah. Golden Gloves didn't care what you wore, okay. as long as you guys had different combinations. Okay. <laughs> You could uh, right. you could see the AAU guys with me and uh, on the side stage watching everything. Yeah. That's Golden Gloves boxing. That's just right. the well, way no, it was. No, you have, you validated it. You oh no, not, I, you are not full of shit. I'm not proud right. of it. But I no, called my mother. Why are you not proud yeah, of that's it? That's serious business, right there. Well, well I was trained by Jimmy Katz, the most famous uh, Golden Gloves boxer from New York. He was 71 years old when he was training me when I was a little kid. I was probably eight, nine years old, training at the Y. Uh, he was my grandfather's best you friend. You grew up in Be- uh, Pepper Petroid. Well, I first grew up in Ashtabula. Okay. And because I was the only Jewish family, the Jewish <laughs> boy, everyone beat me up. <laughs> and then when my best friend turned on me, my mother said, "That's it. We're going to we're going to move." And we ended up in Beechwood, which was all Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> it was like <laughs> the powder a- puff class of uh, environment. Well, we 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 used to joke that when they let. Um, my Jewish family into Sugar and Falls. That was because a family had just left. <laughs> <laughs> they had to keep the quota up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was like when my best friend turned on me and beating me up in the driveway, and then my mom comes out and breaks it up. I, I knew that was pretty much over because, you know, we'd go on vacation. My father was a Korean War hero to Bronze Stars and a Purple Heart. Uh, he was a uh, marine engineer, and we'd go to Florida to chase him during the winter because he was working, and we're on vacation, and we come back, and the windows were broken, and this uh, and that, and so it was it was time to go. Right? So wow. I went I went through that that um, wow. kind of anti semitism. Ashtabula yes, definitely not a hotbed of Ashtabula. Jewish activity yeah. there. Well, well my father my father was Finnish; he was Scandinavian. So when my mom married him, this is all in the book. So this is really good stuff you're getting okay. here. My grandfather, her father, kicked her out of the of the family because she married out of religion. Oh. So mm. two years later, I was born, my brother being firstborn. Uh, two years later, my mother, visionary, she said, you know what? I'm going to show my, my, my dad my second child. Screw it. I'm doing it. So believe it or not, she went and went to the house and showed me to my grandfather and he fell in love with me. I was the chosen one. That's it. That's the end of that story. It just was what it was. All of a sudden the family's back and Mm. he liked my father because my father could do anything. He was that guy. So that all, that all worked out. But we moved from Ashtabula to Beachwood, 1968. Hang on a second. Pause there. What did he feel bad about ostracizing your mom with the first kid? I was just under the the marriage. Because uh, like how much of you being the chosen one, not not that you're not, but how much of it is like guilt related because of the guilt to who? Well, because she you, you were saying how your your the mom's Grandpa family got guilty. mad at your mom for marrying outside the fam- outside the family. Yeah, well, that was just because they were pretty religious. And they, they were um, <clears throat> Jewish refugees from Russia. Right. Came oh over on a covered wagon. Yeah, so no, we, say, yeah, but I'm saying like this is just like Fiddler on the Roof, right? Like the question <laughs> is, I saw that by the how, way. But but at some point, uh, he's like, no, I'm cool with you marrying outside the faith. Now that I saw your second kid, it just uh, everything was something erased. just something fell into place with me. He used to tie my socks together. I remember I was just, you know, three, four years. I'd fall over and. He just fell in love with me. I, for some reason, I just made things right. In, in my in my imagination, it was the day that you sang "Wake Me Up" before you go go to your <laughs> for grandpa. The no, to your grandpa. <laughs> no, I didn't. And he that. was like, oh, "This kid is money. <laughs> <laughs> this kid's got a future." No, that was the president. That was George know, W. Bush. Uh, that now, was where that. did Grandpa live? Geneva. Okay. Yeah. Also, he, a hotbed of Jewish activity yeah. and, in Ohio. And the kicker is, he had. Um, well, they had a, a barbecue on Route 20, which was the major thoroughway from Cleveland to Erie. And during the Depression, they had this barbecue restaurant and eight cottages. So people that were traveling had no money. My grandfather would say, listen, I'll feed you if you clean the cottages. For instance, it was a barter uh-huh. system uh-huh. in the day. And then my mom uh, was born in 27 not long after the depression. So she knew about it and grew up in that environment of the barbecue. And that's where she met my father at 15 years old because he was, um, 
he he was an alcoholic and i think he blacked out at 15 huh. my mother said and he came into the barbecue and fell in love with my mom and would run from ashtabula to geneva and then one day there was a guy combing her hair and my dad walked in what? <laughs> and he just took him outside and they went to myers road which was a famous road from Route 20 to Geneva on the Lake, which I drove at eight years old because fast forward, my grandfather owned a junkyard of six and a half acres of cars. So by the time I was nine, I could take a car and drive it down that road. Hmm. And there was only two or three sheriffs in Geneva back in the day. Right. But anyway, my dad took this guy out and the only one that came back was my dad. Uh Bloodied bloodied up, but that guy never came back. So it was Uh, like, so so they chased, they chased, he chased her. Strange women's hair. Yeah. The moral of he chased story. her till they were 29, and then my mom was like, you know, I'm, I hit my biological period. <laughs> He's good looking. He treats me well. I'm not in love with him, but let's get married. Uh-huh. <laughs> and that's how it went. That's that's oh, how it was. She gave up the run, the chase. Very romantic. Yes. That was yeah. a long chase, 15 to 29. I mean. Yeah, that was a long chase. She really. You know yeah. what? That says something for persistence. Great. Yes. Good great, for your dad. Great stories. Yeah. Oh, I love He would that. borrow people's cars and drive by their house. And back in the day, you know, the carbureted cars, he would um, race by the house, shut the ignition off, and the fuel pump would still be going into the cylinders. And then he'd turn the ignition on and it would backfire because of the implosion of all the gas in the cylinders. So she knew it was him. And he'd do handstands. Just the total movie oh, yeah. movie stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. John Cusack uh, stuff. Right. 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 Hold the boom box in front of the window. Mm-hmm. So, so, yeah, we need to go back. So we, we, we talked about the boxing and then does Zaza uh, come? Is that the first band or? No. Uh, well, or the cover the, band. This, the cover is, a, band this is another good story. And this is visionary of my mom. I, I mean, like, you talk about visionary companies like Procter & Gamble, even to Apple of today. My mom was that visionary mother. I called her up after the the championship fight, and I said, Mom, I'm coming home. And she goes, I'll come and get you. And I'm at Ohio State. I'm in ZBT, Jewish fraternity, right. by the way. <laughs> uh, side note, um, my mom went to Ohio State. That was her alma mater. She was in love with a guy named Stanley Krongold from ZBT. The fraternity oh I was in. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so uh. I looked for his picture never found it. So my brother's name is Stanley. Are you getting that right now? <laughs> I've met Stanley. Yeah. My father loved Mickey Rooney, and my mother said, no, Mickey Mackey is never going to work. <laughs> is, uh, uh, Another visionary move. Yeah. So Wait, I, hold on a second. Is your dad still alive? No, he passed. Does he before. know that um, his firstborn was named? No, after... he never did. <laughs> Dude, no. your mom loved and <laughs> did, never did. Oh, yeah, he, she was loving, and she turned down the first and only call for a date, saying because she was so nervous. My mother was so nervous. Um, she said, "Oh no, I, I can't go out. My hair's wet. Yeah, they didn't have blow dryers, <laughs> so she never went out, and he never called her back. Oh. So I." called her that night and I said I'm coming home and uh, she says I'll come and get you and I go no mom I have my car here and uh, I, I said I'll, I'll be home late and she goes I'll wait up for you no so I get home at four in the morning on that night and she opened up the door true story I walked in and I said mom I want to be a rock star because <sighs> I knew what I wanted and she goes, I'll give you rock star. <laughs> she goes, you're going to go to the Cleveland Institute of Bartending to learn how to bartend, to have something to fall back on. Mom, I never fell in the ring once. And then she showed me that left hook, and uh, which she was trained by her uh, grand, uh, by her dad, who was you know, uh, M- Mr. Katz, who was the greatest. So she knew how to throw a punch. So I was like, next morning, I was down at the Cleveland Institute of Bartending for 200 bucks for two weeks and got my degree. But before I was even 21, I got a first job. At bartending, uh, so that's that's how that really well, went, went down. I, I've got I've got a question. In Florida and a at that point, or were you Beachwood? Oh, we were back and forth, but that yeah. was in Beachwood at that moment in time. Yeah. So, um, a question and a comment. The comment is, um, I think it's interesting that the bartending gig was the fallback gig. And, yeah. Right. Just, like, yeah. In case things don't work out, you can you still can be, be a bartender. bartender. Right. I think that's hilarious. Do you think that's funny? Yes. But yeah. but that but listen that made a lot of money for instance 96 7 and 8 i was working at the crazy horse making over six figures a year as a full-time bartender 
five days a week. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's, it's documented. Yeah. It's on my taxes. I mean, that's where we met when I was working. So, so <laughs> my satellite conference room back in the early years. But you know what? Really, in the long run, getting back to the visionary. I know we're going back and forth and here and there and times, but um, in '94, my father passed away uh, in the port of Spain on the first port of call on the second Persian Gulf War. He went to the first one, shock and awe, and then the second one, he was on a spy ship, um, and um, he called from Spain. I answered the phone, talked with him. Uh, I was the last one to see him alive in Norfolk, Bayonne, New Jersey, as an officer's child. It's great growing up as an officer's child. And he um, he said, uh, can you pick me up? I'll fly you out in a Fed jet to uh, Bayonne, and uh, Norfolk, and we'll we'll go home together. I said, yeah, Dad. And I let the phone go, and my mom got on the phone from downstairs. I was working as a bar, uh, manager at the Billy Club on uh, Richmond and Mayfield. I remember. I grew up there. And I said, uh, uh, okay. And he goes, I love you. I said, I love you, Dad. And he goes, I love you, too. And I thought to myself, that's odd. He said it twice. Well, five minutes later, my mom comes up and says, something happened to your dad. He stopped talking. I, I heard him breathing, but he, he just didn't talk. I said, oh, mom, don't worry about it. And, you know, my mom and I were dudes. We would talk like dudes. We swore at each other. I mean, she'd get in my vet and say, oh, this stupid car. I feel like I'm getting in on the ground. I go, mom, it's a Corvette. She goes, I don't care. This sucks. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, great. But um, my dad passed away wow. uh, on the ship, on the phone with my mother. And my mother never told me what she said to piss him off or to really check him out. But anyway, um, yeah, that was 94. And then shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with dementia. Hmm. So I started taking care of her. So this other visionary uh, part of, there's dozens of visionary that she did. I live uh, today with some of her visionary thoughts and blessings from that. But um. In 99, so I started taking care of her in 94. I was her caregiver. I nebulized her. I bathed her. I took her to doctors. I gave her all her medications, et cetera, et cetera. In 99, we were in Florida because I'd take her to Florida for six months, uh, December to May, and home May to December. So it's August late of 2000, and they asked me to uh, be a bartender for the P.F. Chang's, the first corporate restaurant in Beechwood ever 2000 on Chagrin Boulevard so they pulled up and asked me and I was in one of my cars taking her for a ride and I said no I'm not interested and she she gave me an elbow to my chest that would have knocked anyone out and she says you help that young man <laughs> I said all right what do you need and he goes be at the uh the mobile uh, facility at 10 in the morning on the property and we're going to interview you and I said great so I I gave my mom stink eye, took the car back, took the other car, took her home, you know, did my job. And in the morning, I rode my Harley, did the interview, tried to pick up the girl that was interviewing me because she was hot. <laughs> of course, I got the job. And um, 11 years later, P.F. Chang's. Huh. And they allowed me to go to Florida to work at the Boca Chang's, which I opened in 01. And then Palm Beach in 04, which was my mom's last um, ability to travel. But how cool was that to be able to work six months here, six months there, at the doing the same gig at P.F. Chang's in the same schedule? Well, they paid and, all my mom, insurance. And by the way, and that was my mom, another visionary, because I didn't want to do that. I turned him down. I said, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, no. And I, by the way, to clarify my earlier comment, I do know that people make a really good living bartending. Oh, yeah. Right? And that it is an it, it is a craft that people work on and develop over time. And it's I, something you can always go back to yeah it just you know? i don't think i've ever heard of anyone saying this will be your safe job right like this will this is the fallback job well there's been oh, she, listen, knew, there, she there, was yeah obviously she, she was a visionary because you made a lot of money doing it. it was what she said and and after a while after you're wrong every time that your mother's right yeah you just cave in That's right. yeah. she says something you just go all right <laughs> but my, like it or not all right you but, were a good son my but my question was going to be though um, you decided to be a rock star after you had just won, uh, like, the Golden Gloves as a welter. Yeah, like, but let me tell you something. That was... Uh, is that a fluke, you think? No, that was just... It got harder and harder. And oh, yeah. It just... I, I didn't want to do it anymore because it was brutal. Yeah. Because when you weigh 142 pounds and you're six foot, you're nothing but fiber, tissue, 
uh, and speed. And I trained. I worked hard at it. But just now just I'm, to pause, just so everyone knows, those are my measurements as well. Perfect. <laughs> so I, I'm You'd fighting able- inner city yeah. kids who are just as tall and fast. And yeah. It's hard. It gets yeah. hard. Can you imagine how much punchier you would be right now if you would have stayed with that? <laughs> Well, you wouldn't even be on the podcast because we wouldn't I, understand what you're I, saying. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. So you you say now I want to be pretty quick. You say Two I want to be a rock star. Yeah, I told her. I Mom be a rock star. says you're going to go to school and get yeah, your, something to fall back on. Yeah, yes. which you did, and then you then, said, "Ha ha! I got my piece of paper. I'm now an official bartender. I'm still going to go be a rock star." Yeah, and a side note: I was 20 years old. I'm working at this bar. It was called Dino's Riverstone on Mayfield and Belvoir. It became so popular which I was blessed to be at all these bar restaurants that I worked at became the most popular. I don't know how that happened. I I was blessed. Um, But I remember the first bar fight and I jumped over the bar thinking, I got this. And then some (laughs) hell's angels got grabbed me by my hair and pulled me down to the ground. I said, "Uh Oh, this is not good. (laughs) There's no, there's no winners. And that was the last time. Did you have your long hair at the time? I did not. I had some hair, but they just, a guy just grabbed me. He was all tatted up. He was, I thought I was going to die. And that guy didn't hit me. I go, no, I'm no good. I don't know what I said, but, there's no winners in fighting, and I know that more than anybody. Yeah. You, you just get beat up. There's no winners. So, um, I don't. I don't know how much time we should spend on Zaza because I want to talk about spasmatics a lot. Um, so, well, talk about Zaza for a minute. Tell it, us how you got to spasmatics. And yeah. I want to talk about your genes. Well, let me just give you a little Molly, general overview. <laughs> I was a drummer. That was my first love. I was eight years old. My grandfather was in love with me, obviously. We went over that. He bought me a pair of 46, 1946 Rogers Sparkle drums. I, w- I was eight years old. I was going to school in the morning at Beechwood. And he s- came in. It was 730. He says, I got something in the car. I need you to bring inside. And I said, okay. And I went out and it was a drum set. It was so cool. I brought him inside. Didn't go to school that day. Didn't even know how to set him up. But I loved him so much that I just I trained myself. I took some lessons and I did it. I, I, by the time I was 14, I was considered a world-class drummer. I won all the major awards in Cleveland and then I got in trouble for the last one, which my mom wouldn't let me do again. It was 500 bucks and two rooms at the Ramada on Rockside and 271, if you remember Is what that. you win if you become yeah, the best I, drummer? I won, I won this uh, contest and my friends got caught for underage drinking. <laughs> so my mom said at 14... No more. Oh, I did Wipeout. I did a version of Wipeout. Nice. That's what's oh, going on. Nice. I did a really... Yeah, that's a big drum solo Yes, in that I did a really cool version, and no one else did it or could do it. But I got in trouble. And my mom, being a lawyer that didn't practice, uh, she got me out of trouble and said, that's it, you're done. No more of that. So fast forward, when I came home and wanted to be a rock star, I auditioned as a drummer. I wasn't a singer. Let's get that straight. I didn't sing. I didn't know I could sing. So I auditioned for my first gig as a drummer, and I got it, of course. That's how I felt. And I asked my mom if she would help me with a, you know, some money to buy some extra drums. And I started playing. And long story short, a couple agents saw me because I began singing as a drummer because we lost our singer in that band. So I would rehearse and sing the song so we could rehearse. All of a sudden, they looked at me after auditioning all these people and said, crap, you're our singer. Yeah. You're a singing drummer. So I learned to sing and play drums at the same time because I guess I could. That's unusual. Yeah. Yes. That's um, rare. So we opened up for the gods. This is 1980, 81. And an agent, Marty Schloss, saw me, said, screw that drum stuff. You could sing, dude. And they whisked me off to an audition weeks later for backseat romance which broke into caravan and quick i auditioned for quick which was a better version i walked into the studio one guy was doing blow one guy was smoking oh pot my. one guy was drinking shots of jack and how old are you at this time i was fresh 21 years old okay. wow and i was skinny and naive and but i didn't care i was in a good band i loved that band and they said hey kid can you sing lucky ones by lover boy and i go yeah all right let's go and they kicked it off. I thought, wow, this is cool. In a in a rehearsal hall in Painesville, I got three quarters of the way, and they stopped. They said, hey, kid, you want to be our drummer? 
Hmm. <laughs> I mean, singer, Thanks. excuse me. And I said, yeah. And uh, the next day I'm in front of 600 people singing about two or three songs that I knew. And that's how I started as a singer. Wow. And that was and for I, quick. That was for quick, yes. Uh -huh. And I took lessons at the Cleveland Institute with uh, Bill McCabe um, for six months. And what I learned in six months was forever the greatest thing I could ever learn because he got a job at Ohio State. They asked him to um, take a big job in the uh, music field as a director in Ohio State. So I lost him and never could duplicate singing uh, lessons. So I just did it myself, trained myself. And um, uh, fast forward again in 87, I finally told Quick, I said, I want to be writing songs because I started to write. And I had this vision. And, uh, he definitely. I mean, just from talking, he's a storyteller. The the night you know I mean? like, uh, the night that I had a meeting, no one showed up. One guy's getting a blowjob. Excuse me. <laughs> one guy's doing drugs. One guy, and no one showed up. I'm standing there and going, "Okay, I quit," and I quit, and I never walked back. Wow. And uh, kept writing. Went into Angel Studio, and one day I got a call from um, Saza's drummer. They were basically stalking me <laughs> and he said hey we really like you can i meet with you i i want to listen to some of your material and i've got some material so uh we had a meeting at my house in beachwood and it was great and we had a rehearsal in um on tourney road in garfield garfield and it was magic and i knew this mm -hmm. is this is special and we signed a deal to play the Sahara Club, which was called Token Tuesday, which became the number one, according to Rolling Stone, greatest weekly rock and roll event in the country. What? what? Yes. Where was the Sahara Club? The Sahara Club was on uh, 91 and Route 6. Willoughby? Willoughby? It's Willoughby Hills. Something like yeah, that? Gale's yeah, Gales Garden Center's right there on the yeah. corner. So yeah. we uh, started playing there. We signed a deal for every Thursday. We, we, we created something really unusual. And um, next thing you know, I went home and broke up with my girlfriend from Florida, who I met on tour in 83. And um, I wrote that song, Maybe Tomorrow, and I laid it down in 20 minutes after I sent her back home to Florida that night with her sister and her dog. <laughs> and I brought it to rehearsal a few days later, and the guys just looked at me with like a ghostly, jaw-dropping look and said, that's a hit. And... Sure enough, we recorded it, got it to MMS Kid Leo. He played it, and it blew up. That's ex you know, mm. basically how it all started. And mm. then, you know. What does that mean, blew up? It, like, did it go it national? The charts. They, it went 26 stations across the country immediately, picked up that song. Every station in Cleveland picks it up. We got a record deal, EMR Records, but it wasn't a national deal. But yet, it was big enough that we could tour the country and promote it, and people just came out. They were buying it. We, we went mm. from maybe 20 pieces of mail a week to like 200 a day. Wow. They would send pictures and things underwear. and girls. Yeah, we made major magazines like Hit Parader. Um, did you get underwear in the mail, Double we did. D? Yes, yes, yeah. we did. Women on were the just stage, did they throw it up to on Listen, the stage? Listen, after five years I've in a tour bus. I've got mine ready for Tuesday. After five years in a tour bus, I coined the phrase, I've forgotten things most men dream about uh -huh. <laughs> and you could take it from there uh-huh so that's how yeah. zaza started the hit single and then boom we were on the road with the previous bands that i mentioned in 94 about a year after the band broke up steve perry from journey which was my mentor called but you knew steve perry from journey I, he called michael belkett i did not know him he was just my idol called michael belkett and said hey get this kid this david dennis kid i want to have him on my uh a tour, this is, which was his last tour, Love of Strange Medicine. And uh, I, I played the last few dates of his uh, last tour, Love of Strange Medicine. Oh so gosh. the first night was Vets Memorial in Columbus. We were sequestered, very professional. We just got off the road with Vince Neal, which was screwball because every night he was so coked out. Every other night we wow. couldn't play because he had an excuse for something. So I took the gig. I took two of my guitar players. We went to Vets the first night and uh, sequestered and then they called us I could hear him singing and we were like oh my god this is great and I was a little nervous obviously I got on stage and we did one song for sound check and I got done and I walked off and he met me he walked up on stage 
Oh Steve God. Perry. Freaking Steve Perry. Oh, my god. And he gosh. goes, hey, man, you're really good. And I go, well, I learned from the best. And I pointed at him. He goes, oh, come on. And we just locked it in. It was like uh, and the next night was at Masonic Arena in um, Toledo. And I remember getting lunch. And it was Everything was so, like, right to the point, perfect Cornish hands, seven different meals for lunch, right on time. And I was eating, uh, picking out my food, and all of a sudden I hear, hey, don't feed that guy. And it's Steve Perry yelling out at me. And I'm like, oh, my God, dude. Um, so I sat down with him, and we talked for 20 minutes. I'm pinching mm, myself every uh, minute going, mm. he's really talking to me. So we talked about a few things, and one of the, the greatest stories he told me was how he wrote Love and Touch and Squeezing. Tell. And I got the story before he ever told it later on on VH1. It went like he was recording for Journey. He had a girlfriend. They were in the Bay, uh, San Francisco, and they had some technical problems. He came home early to his apartment, and the apartment had high windows, so you had to kind of like on your tippy toes look out to see the street. Anyway, he comes home early. His girlfriend's not home. He wonders where she's at. No cell phones, obviously. This is, uh, you know, early 80s. Uh, so he kind of naps out, and all of a sudden he hears a rumble, and he gets up. He looks out the window on his tippy toes. He sees his girlfriend kissing the driver of a Corvette. Uh-oh. And he's like, oh, man. So he, so he goes... He goes, David, I did what a, a girl would do. I faked like I was sleeping. And she got into bed, and then the next morning I booted her out and wrote Love and Touch and Squeeze. Wow. And I was, sitting, I was pitching myself the whole time going, oh, my God, he's telling me the story. Keep going. Did, did you and, have um, your vet at the time? No, I did not. <laughs> no. No, I had a vet already, but I sold it. But uh, You weren't making out with no, Steve Curry's girlfriend. No. Okay, that's good. So, so what, what happens with Zaza? How long are so, you in it? What, and, and what Zaza going? starts in 87. Obviously, the, the hit single plays in August 3rd of 88. Uh, it goes viral. Every station in Cleveland's playing it. We go from 200 people to 2,000 people. At, at a show? At a show. Okay. I mean, it is a dream come true. It is, it is where you get up in front of 2,000 people and you go to sing the chorus and you can't even hear yourself because they're singing the chorus mm -hmm. because the power of the radio... Is right. that they're singing it? But here is my greatest story about the power of the radio and writing a song that really inspires people. It's about three weeks in to the single, and as I said, we're now playing for thousands of people, and we're doing the show in Spanky's West, and it's sold out. And I bring my mother with me, and. Uh, the security comes up and says, hey, there's this lady. This is pre-show. We already did sound check, so I'm kind of wandering around aimlessly in the backstage green room. And he says, there's this woman that wants to talk to you. And I said, fine. And uh, I bring my mom, and security's with me. And here is a, a girl that was about to be married in Toledo to her high school sweetheart. She was from Sandusky. And he got killed in an auto accident three days before the wedding. Mm. Now, she's driving home after the funeral. She's got medication. She knows how to kill herself. Garage, car running, the whole nine yards. And she's driving home to do this. And she hears Maybe Tomorrow on the radio on MMS. And for some reason, this song struck a nerve in her soul. Wow. And she pulled off the side of the road, as she was explaining... And we were all freaking out. I mean, my mom was crying. And she goes, I knew from that song that I could go on with my life and I will see him again. And she said, I, I drove off the median. I canceled my death sentence and I called them a mess. And I said, who sang that? Who, what song? And they gave her all the information and she came in and told me that song. She wow. was bawling. My mom was bawling. I was bawling. Security's right. crying. I couldn't believe that wow. I just did that. I wrote a song that saved someone's life.
I mean, that's crazy. That's the power that you of music. know, you know, that's the one that, that you was, know of. No, there was more. That's there what I mean. More. Yeah. And other songs. Um, I would do it again that I wrote um, after losing someone that I loved a lot. Um, I, and 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 this guy in Kentucky on the road said my grandfather lost his his wife, my grandmother. He's not wasn't doing anything. He used to work on my cars with me, and now, and all of a sudden, I bought your CD, uh, Party with the Big Boys. And I would do it again. He kept playing it over and over. I go, Grandpa, what's going on? And he goes, you know what? This is great. And from that moment on, he was helping him build cars again. So he came to a concert and told me that. Melodies that haunt me Bring back the day When I do Anything for you Anything for you and I won't do it again. So what happens to Zaza and when? Um, we're now living in L.A., basically. Uh, we played the Whiskey A Go-Go, and uh, wow, we're on the verge a of a record deal. deal with Columbia Columbia Records, and Nirvana comes along, a band named Nirvana, with Kurt Cobain. And um, next thing you know, I don't even get a phone call back. Yeah, people don't like 80s music as much anymore. No, it, it just, it, it was in an instant. It was Here like a yesterday. light bulb. Yeah. And I couldn't I couldn't get a call back. And we're sitting there in LA. We're losing money now. We can't play that much. I got the tour bus. And um, I, I even got as far as doing some diabolical things by uh, saying I was, you know, because I look with my hair, I look like David Coverdale. So I went to Geffen Records to uh, John Kalodner, who was head of Geffen Records, just got off the road with Aerosmith, and I told the secretaries, I lied, I said I was David Coverdale's son, can I talk to John Kalodner? Well, they let me in. I got to Kalodner, and he came over there, and he's like six foot five, really hairy, beastie guy, and he goes, who the hell are you? <laughs> I said, I'm David Dennis, I'm his band Zaz, I wrote this um, regional hit song, maybe tomorrow, and he goes, listen, give me that tape, get the hell out of here. And I basically just ran out of the building. I mean, that's how bad it was. And I had to write an apology letter to all his secretaries. But it came as fast as it went. I mean, it came. As, that's how it goes. Yeah. You, you kind of look a little like David Coverdale, actually. Not yeah, with, with those it's White Snake, right? Oh yeah, I know exactly yeah. who it is. Yeah, <laughs> silly. That's a pretty good move, though. Get, yeah, listen, get when your you're door. when you're um, you just try to do anything we could possibly do just to try to figure out what the heck happened. And um, well, I, I remember like... walking down the street of Sunset, um, going to Rainbow because we used to, um, we used to, uh, when people came in to visit us in L.A., we knew that they had money because they were on, the, you know, vacationing. So we would hit them up uh, for um, wow. pizza at the Rainbow. That's um, that's you. That's me in '91. My goodness, at the release of Party with the Big Boys. That was. Uh, Taken by Anastasia Panzios. That's um, live at the Cat Club. Of course, the band Zaza. So you see the hairs. You see the look yeah, like. So I got away with the Coverdale thing. Sure. But funny story was I was walking down. Send uh, those to us if you could. Yeah. I will. I, on, I'm on Sunset walking with my drummer, Sticky. <laughs> what a great story that was. What a great name. But um, yeah, Sticky was That's the drummer. A great name, Scotty actually. Cormus. He's great. Um, some guy yells out. Hey, Coverdale, you suck. And I just <laughs> kept walking because I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you took it as it came. But that's how it basically ended. And we limped home and then we did we started another East Coast tour, which was at a club called Impacts in Buffalo. And we did the sound check and we were so burnt out from just playing for all these years and half a million miles and a bus. And we got back in the green room, we're all looking at each other. And then Neil goes, hey, guys, I just want to let you know it's going to be my last uh, tour. I'm going to just do instrumental music. I I'm done. And we were like, okay. <laughs> we were so burnt out we didn't Everybody know how to respond. Yeah. yeah. So we played that night. Uh, Impacts was owned by the Mafia, basically. It was a cool place. And then we canceled the whole East Coast tour. And we, we limped home. I think we had a hundred bucks left. I put it in the fuel in the bus, which got us about eleven hundred miles back in the day. It was nine nine cents a, a <laughs> gallon for diesel, and uh, we did one more show at the fairgrounds in Berea and made a lot of money. And that was it. But it was a sad day. 
Yeah. How long had the band been together? Five years straight. Huh. And it was the greatest five years of my life. I mean, because we were all friends. We didn't fight. We, you know, we didn't do drugs that's unusual or any of that too. stuff. We that's just, really unusual. We had a lot of girls. That's, I think that was maybe our, you know, your vice. Our vice. Uh-huh. <laughs> but we didn't uh, do drugs or drink that much. Really, we didn't. And um, gosh, I didn't do a drug till I was 36. So, um, so then what happened? <clears throat> yeah, I do. <laughs> no, I mean, what happens between Zaza and Spasmatic? And how long does that go? Well, after Zaza was done, I decided to start my own band. I wrote a whole album called uh, Double D, which was my nickname. So the album was called Double D. The band was called Double D. And I did the exact same tour, the first tour of Double D, as Zaza would do a tour. I played all the places, but it just didn't work out. I, I had a, I'll give you an example of how it got weird with musicians. I had a guy quit on me because I was Jewish. <laughs> had a major show. He goes, I quit. <laughs> Can't work you're, with you're, Jews. You're freaking, you're freaking heeb. I go, wait a minute, Look, dude, please just play the gig. I'll pay you. And then you could quit afterwards. I'll just convert the, for this one. He, show. he agreed to do it. It's a true story. His name was Chris. And, um, he played the gig, which actually was the code. We were home. The Cove in Geneva played the gig. I paid him. He, he quit. Uh, years <laughs> later though, it's a great story. Years later, he became a state trooper for Indiana. You know, the crew crowd. I mean, you can get what I'm getting at. Mm. And then a few years later after that, he shows up at my house one day. Just shows up. I happen to be outside. He drives up. Gets out of his car with a brand new Mossberg shotgun. Gives it to me as a present. Eight shot Mossberg. Worth probably 350 bucks. And says, listen, I just want to apologize for what I did years ago. I was just taken aback. Were you afraid I, he was coming to shoot you? I thought about it. <laughs> yeah. I did. I thought about it. He's got a shotgun. But we didn't really think about it, you know, as we do now. But yeah. uh, he That's gave crazy. me a hug and thanked me and drove off. And I called my my drummer, Stroman Fraley, who wrote Madonna, You're a Slut on the Double D uh, disc. I, I said, <laughs> I said Storm. I go, Storm, well, I'll give you all that stuff. I will. <laughs> okay, I'll give good. you all that stuff. You'll you'll die. It was played on Howard Stern. Madonna or Slut. I played oh. drums on it. He sang it. I let him do that on my own album because I didn't, I figured, you know what? Screw it. If you got a good song, I like it, put it on the album. Just yeah. because I wrote everything else doesn't mean you can't do it. So, uh, yeah, Howard Stern played it several times. It was popular. It helped sell the CD. But I called him up. I said, you're not going to believe it. Chris just showed up with a shotgun, gave it to me for a president and apologized. He goes, oh, no way. I go, yeah, way. <laughs> so we laughed and that was it. Yeah. Yeah. So how long before? So how does so, Spaz, yeah Zaza ends? Double D ends. I continue on. I I do a grunge band called Sins of the Flesh. Uh, some other things. Smash because we were rehearsing one night for a cover band of the '90s, and my mother comes downstairs and goes, "You sound great. You're going to be a Smash." And I thought, "What a great name, <laughs> Smash." So let's fast forward a little bit. It's now. 1996, I'm taking care of my mom. She's got full-blown dementia. I just quit. I quit. I couldn't take it anymore. I was done. Music just burned me out. I was burnt. Um, so 96, I stopped. I didn't sing. I was taking care of my mom, going back and forth to Florida, doing odd jobs. And then that obviously what I said in 2000, I got the P.F. Chang's gig. So that sustained me for 11 years. So my mom passed in 06. But you know what? Uh, she had a lucid moment one night. And said uh, in the hallway after I bathed her, David, when I get to God, I'm going to tell him how good you took care of me. And that just killed me for a split blink of an eye. I wanted to die. But I muscled up real quick and I said, Mom, shut up. Just save me a seat at the bar. (laughs) So the book is going to come out within about a year and a half. It's called Save Me a Seat at the Bar. Let's, Let's talk spasmatics. Okay. All right. When does it start? How? Here's a good one. Um, it's it's 04. I've been asked by uh, Dave Moss, the Moss Man. He comes over one night. Is that MMS? Or the Moss oh, Man's on Fox 8. Yeah. Fox 8. And, yeah. The, he's my neighbor in Beecher at the time across the street. He comes over one night. It was a beautiful, I believe it was an August night, uh, about 7 o'clock, knocks on my door. And of course, I know him and his wife. And you know, I come to the door. Like, hey, what's going on? I open up the screen door and he hands me this tape. He says, hey, I need you to learn this song. I go, okay, I'll learn it. 
as a favor. I go, okay, no problem. I go, when do you need this song done? He goes, tomorrow night. And he laughs and he runs off with, with Kim, his wife, to his house. And I'm like, are you kidding me? For God's sakes. So I took it serious. I went down in my studio and I learned that song that night. It took me about four hours. Well, here it was an audition for the song Living the Life for the movie Rockstar Movie Soundtrack with Jennifer Aniston and Mark Wahlberg. This is uh, 2004. So I go down to the audition. It's public at the Hard Rock Cafe, downtown Cleveland. They have all these singers from like regions around and they're doing their thing. And then they call me. Listen, I'm a lead singer of a rock band. That's what I do. This ain't going to be that hard. So I get up there and rip it and I won. They paid me 7K and they shipped me off to California. So I sang back up on Living the Life. No recognition, no you know name mention. I just did it in the studio with a bunch of other singers. But I went to the premiere with uh, Mark Wahlberg, Jennifer Aniston, sat in the same row. I sat next to, um, oh my God, uh, Tony and John Stula uh, were the managers of Marilyn Manson. He sat next to me with those crazy eyes. Oh my God. He goes, hey dude. And I go, hey Marilyn. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting there going, oh my God. We watched the premiere. And then afterwards we got limoed to the House of Blues, West Hollywood Sunset. And um, we... Uh, it was just partying. I was a little buzzed and they asked me to sing a song. So up on stage was Zach Wilde from Ozzy, Rudy Sarzo from Whitesnake, and the band Metal Shop, which is now the big band Steel Panther, which are friends of mine. Travis is from Michigan Falls, Ralph, Russ. And I went up and I sang uh, Still the Night. And I ripped it. I had a great time. I was just feeling great. Got back in the green room and two guys came up to me from Perfect World Entertainment. And they just said, who are check. you? Just wrote a check to PW. No, yeah, yeah, right. right? And, right and they did. said, who are you? I go, oh, I'm David Dennis. I was in a band. And saws. I wrote this regional hit song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Come on. It took me over to uh, Hollywood Sushi, and they asked me to do this Spasmatics in Cleveland met, and Metal Shop, two, two bands. And I said, no. I just turned them down flat out because I was burnt. I, it's now 04. It's eight years later, but I'm, I'm not interested. And I, I went home to Florida. Uh, and bring my mom home and they chased me and then finally they said uh, Dave Baker will be your guitar player and he called me and I said well this would be bad to be playing with Dave Baker who's now Kelly Pickler in Nashville's uh, guitar player um, so I finally uh, I caved and in November of 04 we played Panini's Jerry Spazillo's Panini's in Mayfield as um, burnt toast. We didn't call ourselves Spaz yet. We wanted to test drive it. Well, everyone heard about it. The word was out. The place was packed. And I played. And I had a religious moment. I knew that I was supposed to be a singer and entertain people. Period. All the fans from Zaza were there. People that were in the guys that were in my band um, from Out of the Blue. Fans were there. Decade Dave Baker's band was. Fans were there. And it was just couldn't get in the building. And I knew, and that's what started. I think it was November thirteenth of oh five, oh four. Let's talk, so spasmatics. Is, so spaz is, started oh four yeah. late November. It's a franchise. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, I didn't know all this stuff, but it was a franchise based out of L.A. Um, by a guy named Roger Sauce and Jamie Brooke, and um, we were probably one of the maybe the fourth spasmatics. I want to say. Uh, there's now eight states that have spasmatics. There's three in Texas alone. I've been blessed enough to be able to sing for all the spasmatics except for uh, L.A. and Seattle, which was a testament to how well I knew my uh, material and maybe how well I, I sing and perform. So um, I did all of that. But, yeah, they, they own Metal Shop, uh, uh La Freak, Disco Inferno is our sister band. They own that. Huh. They own Metal Shop, uh, all that stuff. Yeah, but, they're huge. But uh, can I, 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 just from a pure business sense for a second, and, mm -hmm. and as a lawyer, I want to ask you a couple questions about Well, that. I live with a lawyer all my life, my mother. But, well, go ahead. But, but the model is fascinating because, to be, so you've got like a franchisor, 
right? Whoever, per, what is it? Perfect Eagle? Perfect World Entertainment. Perfect yeah. World Entertainment. PWE. <laughs> so, Perfect Eagle. Whatever. They figure out how to reduce their costs and how to market it properly and how, and they've got like a, a logistics group that sets up all of your shows. Like all you do is show up. Like, right. It, I haven't that, talked to Double D throughout this process because yeah. the spasmatics have already played for us. They're, but they're but like, I haven't talked to Double D except the yeah. initial conversation. I've been working with the PWE people. Yeah, Perfect people. World, Roger. They're, well, they're you, like your back office, basically. And they well, do they're everything. the management and the owners. So basically, yeah. they have the word of where we play, for how much we play, how long we play. Somebody at, at some point was the first Spasmatics. And yes. they had a look. L.A. And, Right, and they had a look, and they had a mm-hmm. sound, and they had a song mm-hmm. selection, mm-hmm. Um, and some then, the owners were part of that first process, early '90s. Yeah, and at some point, somebody decides to get really entrepreneurial and says, "I've got a vision for replicating this in other cities," mm-hmm. and and the capability. They were both musicians. Okay, and so they go to that city. They, or presumably, they already know somebody in that city, and they talk to them, and they say, "Hey, you like our band?" See how many people we're bringing into the bar. This could be you. Find me, help me find a, a drummer and a keyboardist or whatever, right? And they just keep replicating that process and keep getting right. better they at be- it. They became really, really good. They were booked a lot, and then they decided to duplicate it and get another band, yeah. dress the same way, play the same songs, have the same repertoire, the same dress. Everything right. the same. And just for and our it listeners, keeps working. They're an '80s cover band, and they dress like nerds. Like, yes, just like so that everybody they act like yeah. nerds. It's like act the biggest like show band yeah. of nerds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and I'm just, I mean, you play in places like the Winking Lizard in Newberry. You just played this past weekend. Zeppies. Zeppies. Ze- Zeppies. Right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Zeppi. Like I, I packed it up because you I've seen the people you in there. a bigger awesome. venue with a big stage. It shocks me that that you could even and I don't I've never been in the Zeppies at Newberry, but like I would just think that you would blow the windows out and crack them like I. Well, the the blessing and the talent of this band is is we're built for a big stage. Yeah. But yet you get us in a small venue and you pack the place. We're going to give you that because yeah. we feed off of it. You know, the yeah. um, the Willoughby Brews. It's going to be interesting hopefully. at ours because we don't have a huge. It, it's the Pinecrest Lawn. I can't so wait to it's, hear it. It's going to be a. It's going to be interesting. So we'll figure um, it out. I mean, you'll be great, but. Yeah, and and um, I think it'll be a huge night. Oh, There's it's going to be so huge many night. people. Yeah, are yeah. talking yeah. about it already. Yeah. Um, there's... You know, Alex Gertzberg is the um, the Simple Summer Night uh, sponsor for our entire series, FYI. Okay. Well, nice. Yeah, you'll be saying his name a couple of times. I'm going to be introducing them. You so, are going to be introducing yeah, them. I can't oh, wait. We're going to yeah. blow you up. I can't wait, man. I'm excited about it. I still need to... We need to go back to the present. We cannot okay. skip yeah, past the president. First of all, which bush is this? This was George W. In the, 05. The, the, the second bush. First was H.W. So Correct. this is, okay, the Correct. second one. Correct. So it, you, this is a great story in itself. All right, well, let's hear it. Okay, I'll give you a little briefer. <laughs> we played, um, let's see, so that was December. So in no, early November, we play, we fly to Washington and we play what's called the National Food Festival for uh, Health uh, in, in Washington. And Cher and Tina Turner are there. It's a huge 80s event. They have couches. You, you wouldn't have believed this. But we also had already played for Jessica Simpson's birthday party, her 21st. <laughs> now, now, how do you get that gig, the Cleveland band? You know what I mean? Like, they're the shit. They're, I know, but they, there's six of you or the well, nine I'm going to just say this. I think the owners understand our capabilities and mm-hmm. talent level, and I think they sent us to certain places to play because they knew – we you would deliver. Gotcha. So with that being said, Jessica told Jen, Jenna Bush they were best buddies. Now they're not. We all know that. But Jessica said, you've got to have these this band for your for Christmas party. Hmm. We didn't know anything about this. Trust me, this is way beyond our imagination. So, But we go out and we play this Washington gig. We fly in. We know where we're going. We play it. It's great. Unbeknownst to us, Jenna is with Secret Service in the kitchen watching us play. And um, she watched us play and said, Daddy, I want that band to play for our Christmas party. 
So we don't know anything about this. No clue. All of a sudden, we get this paperwork to fill out. I thought it was just like tax 1099 or whatever. Background checks? It was background checks, yeah. yeah. But we didn't know it. It wasn't put up to us as background checks. And all of a sudden, we have a gig in Washington. But we don't know where we're playing. It's December. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, we get going. We get our advance as far as our travel. And we fly to Washington. We get our SUV. And we're driving. And I remember we had to go to the five-star Willard. That's all we knew. And from there, we would get our walking papers where we're going, basically. So we get to the Willard. <laughs> and um, we're we're having some fun. We're having some cocktails. And all of a sudden, our owners, the only time we ever saw him, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, Jamie Brook and Roger stuff, they show up and they bring us into the lounge again. And they said, listen, boys, sit down. And we go, what? What's going on? And he goes, you're playing for the president tonight. Hmm. Secret Service is picking you up in 20 minutes. And I'm sitting there going, no freaking way. <laughs> I'm checking in everything because I don't know if I have any illegal drugs on me at that point. Or I don't want to blow this for everything. This is world. So um, 19 minutes later, a man in black showed up with long coats and boots and said, boys, you ready to go? We boarded this van. And went right. Everyone got in. We went right to the White House and went through this simple uh, airport style of check-in. And uh, we Ran around that White House for four hours. We were allowed to go everywhere except for the West Wing and, of course, his his shack. Um, when you go as a civilian, you're on a rope. You can only see maybe the red room, right. maybe the green room. We were all over. Wow. Red, green, blue room, jumping <laughs> on couches, taking pictures. It was the funniest thing you ever That's saw. Insane. Oh, my gosh. It was, it, it, That's insane. We were, we were playing with the dogs of Barney and Fife or whatever the <laughs> frick they were. The Secret Service guy, Sean, I remember his name, was taking us around, and he was really cool. And uh, Anne was our, our host taking us around. And then at 6 o'clock, we got sequestered. And then all of a sudden, she comes and goes, um, we got to go downstairs. So we go downstairs, and we're eating and beautiful food and beds and i took a nap i actually took a nap for an hour six to seven i woke up and uh, we got changed and we're starting to you know chomp the bit wondering what the heck's going on and she comes down at about uh 9 30 and she says uh you guys ready to go we're, we're like dressed we're like waiting we're like sloppy and she goes the president would like to meet you uh you ready to go yep so we go, oh she walks us up, she gets us to the East Wing. We're on this little uh, two-inch stage. All of their equipment, security reasons, none of our equipment. Like We bring our equipment, oh, but not sense. what's called backline drums, amps and stuff are always there for us. They had their own, which was junk <laughs> stuff. So I get on the stage, I turn around, I look down the center lane of the White House. You got the East and the West lanes, wings, and here he comes. He's walking right towards me. And I swear to God, I'm thinking, okay, should I say, hey, Bushy Boy? Um, <laughs> um, he had nicknames for everybody. Georgie Porgy, should I do something funny like that? And then I thought, <laughs> in an instant, I said, my mom would kill me. Uh -huh. So he got up and met me first and said, how you doing, young man? I go, good, Mr. President. How are you doing? He goes, great. I said, let me introduce you to the rest of the guys. Oh, fantastic. So each one shook his hand, introduced them. And uh, wow. then Barbara, his wife, came in. The two daughters came in from the uh, blue room uh, on the west wing side. Sean was waiting at the door. 123 people were sitting there chomping their bit, waiting to party. And uh, they come in, and we mingle, and we talk, and house photographer, because you, you can't have your own uh, pictures while he's in a room. Once he leaves, game on, but not when he's there. So the house photographers are taking all these pictures, so finally, uh, President Bush comes up to me and says, um, David, uh, can you play me a song? It's 9.50, 5.55. I go to bed at 10.10. <laughs> um, can you play me one song? Would you mind? And I said, Mr. President, no problem. So I turned around and went to Dave Baker, and I said, Dave, what do you want to play? And he goes, let's do Wham, Wake Me Up. Isn't that ironic? Oh. I go, perfect. So we went right into Wake Me Up. Oh. He's dancing with the wife. The two daughters were out doing the same thing. I had the glasses on him. I'm grinding on his wife. I am. <laughs> Shut up. I do not. That is not true. It's the truth. You were grinding on Laura Bush. You will not get a picture because Barbara. they wouldn't allow it. But I well, was. Laura, I uh, was. Laura Bush. Yeah. I was grinding on Laura. And, and George W. was boogieing. 
George W. I was boogie. We like. had the nerd glasses on him, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. and he was just t- everything. Oh I the, the daughters, you know, were just spit. That's hilarious. Oh my gosh. Anyway, we t- played this song. He thanked us, and he walked off. Oh, and what a cool um, experience, though. Wow. then Sean allowed 123 of the guests, and it was game on. We played from I swear a little after 10 o'clock to four in the morning. God. It was wow. by the time we were done. All the girls were barefoot. The guys were on stage hitting the drums with sticks. They were drunk. Who's going to stop them? Yeah. Their governor's daughters, yeah. senator's daughters. The, That's crazy. The, oh the empowered gosh. daughters. Who's going to stop them? There was no elderly people to stop them. Um, let's do a let's do a quick lightning round. Okay. Right? Well, sure. I gotta this is down. exciting because I, I his phone's been blowing up. Yeah. So That's fine. here's right. here's my question: go, the last text that you received or or sent you don't have to tell me who it's from you just have to read it because i don't want anyone getting in trouble uh, it's a, it's for a show it's the last text it's for a show for a rush hour bar they want us for a, a date and can we can we... oh, that's boring yeah it's boring <laughs> that's All a right. boring I'm not one tell you the, the okay, sex and, ones and on, yes huh? you are gonna that's what we want <laughs> we want a sex that's gonna be sex. the next segment because there's a lot to say <laughs> it should be the last inappropriate text <laughs> right, that you right. sent or received okay so last show I can show you a video of it oh no thank you, <laughs> you could, I think you could see what that looks like right there it what? does but I don't think it is it, it is yeah that's oh, her my... what okay. what do you <laughs> I mean, you want to get serious? I'll get serious with you. That's a great text. You asked the question. I think I am. Anyhow, double D busting out inappropriate. Yeah, I love. We will not be sharing that one on Facebook. Well, I'm just. She asked the question. I did. Telling you what they're sending me. Yes. Okay. (laughs) That that was. Uh, okay, last last um Go ahead. Last Mo. Sh- Go I ahead, can't Mo. even talk at this yeah, point. Great. Last last show drink. you binged. Last show you binged. Yeah, um boy, can I think of it? It was Netflix. Um it's uh the motorcycle group um uh Sons of Anarchy. Sons of Anarchy. Yes, oh, thank you very much. Is that, like that? a good one? Is that good? I haven't watched Unbelievably that. great. People dig that. Unbelievably great. Okay. Yes. All right. Yes. That's the last one. You what are your what, songs? Molly, hold on. You you used to you had another one. Sons of Anarchy. That, yeah, yeah. What what's was on your it? mind? It's what's, oh, on your what's on your mind? What's on your mind right now? I'm just in a good place. Uh, okay. Honestly, I, I, the band's doing great. I'm blessed to be healthy and being able to sing at a high level. You're sexy. Um, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm bartending at uh, you know Bell and Flower. That's going great for me. Uh, unfortunately, I broke up with my girlfriend uh, three weeks ago. But you know, for all the right Obviously reasons. Obviously, not stopping you. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm just in a good place and just happy to be who I am and and proud of what I've done and. And um, just looking forward to the future and live every day as it was my last since Amen. I was 27. Are, are you uh, at Bell and Flower like full time or? How- I'm doing Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays right now. Evenings, yeah, yeah obviously. Yes. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, David, uh, yes. my lightning round Fuck. questions are: Go. You're on a desert island, shipwrecked for at least three months. You don't know when you're ever going to come back, and you can bring along with you the entire discography of only one musician. Who is the musician? Oh, it'd be Steve Perry. Mm, I love that. Yeah. All right. Same island, same shipwreck, at least three months, and you can bring the entire library of any one author. Who's the writer? Oh, probably Spielberg. You're thinking like his his like script, yeah, his, his movie script, yeah, his, scripts, his movies, his scripts. Oh, yep. interesting. Yeah, genre I'm not. A, I'm not a, yeah, I'm wow. I'm gonna bend it because I'm not really a big author book. I like to read something about what's gonna happen in yeah, and just uh, all right. Uh, f- the final lightning round question is: What is an embarrassing thing about <laughs> yourself that no one else knows? Can it include boogers, semen? <laughs> Urine and poop. Uh, don't don't. <laughs> I shouldn't guide don't him into something. The answer. Okay. I think Molly. it's just <laughs> things that I've done that okay. are uh, embarrassing. Um, I think 
the one that comes to mind right now off the top of my head, I'm sure there's hundreds of them, Save for was next I time. was bartending at a um, place close to the Crazy Horse, and I knew a lot of the dancers, and girls showed up, and she said, oh, hey, Double, what's going on? When you get a break, come out and see me. And they had a volleyball court outside, so I, I, I took a break because I couldn't wait to see her, and I walked out, and I thought I saw her were in the same thing and I went up and I cracked her ass as hard as I could and she turned her on and it was a nine month pregnant woman with the same outfit on and her husband saw the whole thing so he came running and I was like oh my god I am so sorry you look like her over there there she is and you were she goes and she said to me quote that's the most action I've had in two months and then her husband came over and gave me grief, and I said, "Listen, I made a mistake. I'm sorry." And then she helped me out, and I walked away. But that was probably oh, that's funny. that's a good embarrassing story. That's, that's a good funny. embarrassing yep. story. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, this has been funny. awesome, Molly. That's Kepler, so. I mean, we right? definitely need a part two. Yeah, this was a There's solid no interview. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear. No I got a lot more doubt. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, yes. thanks for coming on to the uh, podcast, Dave. Sure. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, so. People can find you and your schedule and anything else they want to know about you online by going to? You can go spasmatics.org, S-P-A-Z-M-A-T-I-C-S at dot org. S- dot org okay. and uh, Facebook.com, the Cleveland Spasmatics. Okay. Yeah, Good. those two. Or you can reach me at Davey Bob. Horowitz, my uh, stage name in Spaz. D a v e y h o r w i t z. He does a lot of like on stage pictures Horowitz. right before he goes. Yeah, right yeah. before he's going on. Yeah, I'll and... do some. I'll do some videos. I'll do one um, probably tonight or tomorrow for the this week. We're doing Brothers Lounge and uh, Slim and Chubby's, which are two really good venues That's for a us. Band name, and then we go Chubby. into uh, Pinecrest, which I'll do a video for. Nice. And we'll definitely yeah. be doing a, some a self. I'm gonna try to figure stage. out what I could do for Pinecrest video. Well, I'm, Maybe go there. Let's do it. With guessing. my hard hat. Because they still oh, have yeah. finished oh, a no, lot of things. No. Yeah, it's like a bunch of ants over there. Well, I, I'm guessing that by the time this uh, posts, yeah, that, that there will be video from the Pinecrest show that Nelly will yes. be posting. So if you're listening, within the, if, you're, if you're hearing our voices right now, you should go to thebestpodcastever.com. Mm-hmm. And then on this episode videos. show, you'll see video of our man, Double D, killing it at Pinecrest. Nice. Uh Molly, anything to the uh, oh, we didn't get to kids talk at home? About big fly jeans. Oh, we didn't talk Damn about it. big fly jeans. No, oh, that's another great story. That's another great oh, story. We're gonna have to bring him back. I totally that's a like cliffhanger. Junior, all the great stuff. That's a cliffhanger. Uh, that's a cliffhanger. Uh, cliffhanger. All right. I'd love, love to tell you about that. I would love well, to hear that. Okay, you're coming back. All right, for sure. Dave, thank you, Molly. That all was right. awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, you guys. Thanks, right guys. On. Thanks. Nicholas Weiss of the Gertzberg Law Firm. How are you? Hello, Alex Gertzberg of the Gertzberg Law Firm. I'm doing well. Good. Nice to see you. Thank you for uh, giving us some of your time here. Um, we are going to talk weed law. Good. Nick, we're talking weed law today. Uh, medical marijuana. I wonder if um, I wonder if medical marijuana advocates like um, it being called weed law. As far as I can tell, medical marijuana advocates are fine with all kind of disparaging okay. comments on it. Uh, when I do some presentation, I uh, tried to be called Professor Pot on this okay. at one point. I sure. thought that was funny. So. you got to have a sense of humor about yeah. it. Just by way of background, I mean, Nick, you have been knee deep in medical marijuana legalization um, instruction, topics. You're, you're, you're going to teach... At the Cleveland School of Cab- Cannabis. Yep, that's right. There's a, they're a great, fantastic new school. Um, they're located in Independence. Um, they are very new because you know they, they couldn't even teach on this subject until the law passed. Right. Um, but they are providing a really necessary education for uh, people who want to be employed in the industry, people who are trying to get into the industry, right. people trying to do business with the industry. So that's and, nice. Yeah, and you've given presentations to the Cozy Board on which I sit, to the Warrensville Heights Chamber of Commerce, 
um, and, uh, and, and somehow, uh, you're still making time to be a full-time litigator here. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so you, uh, I think for me, it's safe to say, you know, your stuff. Um, so let's talk about what you know, uh, about drug policies in the workplace. Let's start there. And then we'll talk about doing business with medical marijuana businesses and getting into the business, um, and what all that entails with the understanding that we're going to do all of this in about 10 minutes. So very high level Got it. Uh, discussion. I, I'm happy to talk nitty gritty with anyone who wants to, but we'll, we're not going to be yeah. able to do that today. Right, right. Um, all right. Uh, what's changed in the workplace, Nick, since um, the law went into effect? Uh, what's changed in the workplace is basically you as an employer have a lot more space to move. Uh, on your drug policies, on your drug enforcements, on and as uh, however that affects marijuana because of the new medical marijuana law. Um, when what I mean by that is there are a tremendous number of incentive of incentives for business to have a zero tolerance policy for drugs, um, and this was especially true prior to the medical marijuana law being passed. You get uh, benefit with the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, reduced rates there. It's simpler, it's easier, uh, and so I think a lot of businesses for the purposes of the lowest risk option would just go for that route, would just go for yeah. their zero tolerance. With new medical marijuana law, you have a little more leeway now. If you are a business that believes in the power um, and, and ability of medical marijuana to help people with qualifying medical disabilities, um, you have a lot of room to craft a drug policy that can accommodate people who are suffering from uh, medical conditions, be that cancer, be that chronic pain, um, any of the other enumerated conditions. So in other words, um, well, here, let me ask it this way. Um, can a business prevent its employees from using marijuana while on the job under the new law. Absolutely. Okay. Um, and the new law is, is very specific about this as well. And this is for both recreational and medical marijuana. You can still have your zero tolerance policy. You can still have whatever drug policy you want when it comes to marijuana, and you can't be held liable for enforcing that policy. So long, and I always try to make this, um, I, I always try to stress this, as you enforce that policy consistently. Right. Right. So... It's it, it would fall under any other um, like civil rights action. If you're discriminating against somebody, the marijuana laws aren't gonna, are not going to protect you. You're still liable under civil rights laws. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And specifically under any kind of disability law, be that the uh, the Ohio law, be that be the federal law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the Ohio Civil Rights Act. Um, if you're doing this disparately, as you said, right. um, what an employee who's had some kind of adverse action taken against them, usually that's termination when we're talking right. drug violations, um, can say is this was a pretext. Right. These people don't actually have this policy. They enforce it on some people but not right. other people. Um, and then your really well-crafted policy isn't worth very much. What about um, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act? Can an employer prohibit someone from using marijuana um, when they're claiming that they need it as an accommodation for their disability. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is true under the ADA, the federal ADA, and under state law. Um, under the ADA, although this has been litigated a little bit, um, there are no exceptions, there are no carve-outs for any kind of Schedule One, Class One narcotic, which marijuana still is under federal law, under the Controlled Substances Act. Uh, marijuana has no legitimate medical value. And because it has no legitimate medical value, it can't be held to be any kind of reasonable accommodation for someone suffering from even a legitimate disability. Right. Okay, so employers have a lot of leeway. They should craft good policies um, that match their intentions. Um, before we go on to um, doing business with medical marijuana businesses, um, any other high-level bullet points that employers should know? I think just on a high level, this is going to be, when crafting your drug policy, um, unless you are an incredibly risk-averse business, and, and it's no fault to you if you are, um, 
you have an opportunity to craft something that can fit in your business culture in accommodating people with actual medical conditions who are seeking a medicine to help them, a medicine that happens to be under federal law to be illegal. Um, so if your culture, your company culture, is to accommodate something like that, really look into creating a drug policy that allows you to both enforce your regular prohibited drugs and alcohol at the workplace, but also give people who are suffering an outlet and a way to treat mm -hmm. themselves. All right. So now I'm a business and um, I sell widgets uh, and I uh, want to sell a widget to a dispensary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what do I need to know? Uh, you need to do, I, I'm sorry to say this, you need to do a really thorough doc review. Uh, you need to go through your document, document, document review. review. Yeah, Absolutely. Great. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why is, uh, remember at the, at the start of this, we said this is still illegal under federal law. Um, you, if you are leasing office space, you probably have a clause in your lease, in your commercial lease, that says you can't um, have any kind of drug use, you can't contribute to the sale or transfer of drugs, anything like that in your commercial lease. You probably have a clause that's like that. This could implicate that clause. Mm -hmm. um, you probably have uh, financing. You know, there everyone needs financing, everyone needs loans, everyone needs investors. Right. A lot of those agreements contain prohibitions on you doing anything that could run afoul of the Controlled Substances Act, which would, um, you know, un under certain cir circumstances, include doing business with the medical marijuana community. Hmm. So my selling my products and services to a dispensary, you're saying, could violate a covenant in my loan agreement. That's 100% correct. And, okay. you know, that, that's not going to be true all of the time. You're going to have to, unfortunately, look at this on a case-by-case -case basis, right. which is a, a, a pain. Yeah. Um, but if you want to do business with with this newly emerging market, and right. I think a lot of people are, are going to, especially as this gets sure. up and running, uh, you've got to make sure you're not breaching your own obligations. Right. What else? What else should someone who wants to do business with, you know, a cultivator or processor or dispensary, what else should that business know? Need to know. Sure. Uh, on in purely practical terms. Um, you should be aware that there is not a good mechanism yet, although we're working on this for financing, for financing people in the medical marijuana business. National banks, for the large part, won't get involved, won't touch them because they don't want their charter hurt. Um, the Bank Secrecy Act, federal law, uh, prohibits any kind of lending institution from getting involved in the drug trade. These are under, um, for the, ostensibly to prohibit money laundering, which is the, the main goal of the Banking Secrecy Act. Um, so you should be aware of that. Uh, this isn't going to be, for, the lar for a large part, doing business with a business that can, if they get in trouble, go out and get a loan and then pay you off. Um, just, so just be aware of that that finances for these guys, especially in the short term, are tight. And that might change in the future. But for right now, uh, I advocate getting things in cash. Let's let's step back, right? So medical marijuana is now totally legal in the state of Ohio? Yeah, but let me clarify what that means. Medical marijuana is legal, but getting it is still very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have it now, it's probably illegal um <laughs> and and the reason for that is the mechanisms that we've set up to do all of this for having our cultivators and our processors and our dispensaries and our physicians and our patients they aren't set up um we have a goal and a deadline for september 8th to have mm -hmm. all of these different mechanisms that are supposed to work together to get this product out to people who need it set up and we're probably not going to make that deadline. got it um if one wanted to get into the medical marijuana business, what are their options? What are the categories of things that they can do? Sure, absolutely. There are generally four categories. Um, there, are, there are three that you're 
business owner or your investor or whomever can get into. And, and the fourth is the physician side, and I can talk about that more. Yeah. Um, but at the very top, you've got your cultivators. These are the people Growers. who are actually growing right. marijuana. Um, then below that, you have your processors. These are the people taking the plant and all parts of the plant and turning it into the different products. And then finally, you have your dispensaries. And these are your, your, your what will look, I, I think, at the end, like a small pharmacy. Unfortunately, right now, anyone who wants to get on any of those three levels is going to have to wait. The application period for these has closed, and I think the state is waiting to see what the results of the experiment is going to be before any new applications are opened up for this. I presume that even if you're not a cultivator, processor, dispensary, or physician, you probably um, can be any number of ancillary businesses that I'm, I'm sure are gonna sprout up in this economy, this new economy. That's 100% correct. We, I, I've already been in contact um, with a, a few businesses that are trying to service the needs of yeah. these different groups. Uh, cultivators need equipment. Uh, processors right. um, need trained individuals. All of these people need the general ancillary support right. that you need. So if you're providing HR support, if you're and anything like that, there are areas that you can get into where you can make money in this business really without being part of the business. Right, right. All right, well, folks can find you here if they go to uh, gertzberglaw.com and you click on professionals, you'll see Nick there. And when you click on Nick's name, you'll go to a page with his smiling face <laughs> coming back at you. And uh, you'll see things that Nick has published. And um, I think there's also a prior um, podcast that you did on there. Yes, there right? is. And there's a presentation. There's the, uh, the Warrensville Heights uh, presentation on medical marijuana that you did. Thank you for listening in. And thank you, Nick. Yeah, no problem, Alex. Thanks.